Hi, everyone. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Toxine Middle Eastern Music Podcast. Before we start the interview, we'd like to let you know about our mobile apps. The new Toxime synth allows you to play Middle Eastern sounds, makam scales, and rhythms on your iPhone or iPad. Our Toxy Music app gives you 24 by 7 access to some of the best Middle Eastern music out there on your Android or iOS device. Just search for TAQSIM on the App Store. Today, we welcome Los Angeles-based multi-instrumentalist Danny Shmoon to the podcast. Originally hailing from Detroit, he has performed with a multitude of artists and has become a first call session player in the Los Angeles area. Currently, he is breaking out as a composer, recently releasing a new track entitled Seaside Sultress, which we'll be playing in its entirety at the end of the episode. Welcome to the podcast, Danny. Hey, thank you for having me. We're happy to have you, Danny. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. So Danny, just to kind of get started, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into music? What was the spark that drove you into music? Well, the exact moment I remember quite clearly, I was about three years old, it's just watching a VHS cassette of Ibrahim Tatlasas, actually a live concert that my dad and his friends had. And usually, you know, you got to go to bed when all the friends come over and you're like three years old. But for some reason that night, they just let me stay up and I just sat in between all these like grown men. And I remember just watching the concert. I had no idea what was going on around me, but I was just like, I just found out what I want to do for the rest of my life. Whatever that guy's doing on that derbeke is what I want to do when I get older. That was the moment. How did from then your music aspirations go? Did you start taking lessons? Did you just pick up a derbeke? No, because no one in the family played music. So anything that resembled an instrument from that video, I would just mimic it. And then I got a drum set at like five and I just started playing on that forever. And then, yeah, man, every anytime we'd go to like the Arabic store, that's that's a big thing in Arabic culture. When you go to buy food, there's always dumbbecks in the, in the top level of the place behind like the records and stuff where they sell them next to the hookahs next to the hookahs and stuff so i'd be like yo can i see that can i check that can i see that so i finally got one but it took years and who are you listening to in those formative years all turkish music and assyrian music because i'm assyrian yeah danny i was going to ask you so you're from detroit so you're mentioning Ibo and you mentioned the arabic drums you mentioned your assyrian roots i'm Syrioyo, but we say assyrian just so it's general everybody goes oh okay we know what you if you say Suryoyos, people are like, wait. So being in Detroit, what kind of scene was there with the different multicultural dynamic there? You know, in Detroit, there was a lot of Chaldeans, a lot of Lebanese. Syrians were, you know, there were some, not as many as there is now. And I just remember my first experiences, like my parents weren't people who went to go see Journey Live or Deep Purple or Pink Floyd or whoever was touring. My parents, we went to like Middle Eastern banquets, you know, because they were still new to the country. So I just remembered seeing something and it stuck with me. Whenever I'd go to the parties, I'd notice that the musician's table looked like they were the guys having the most fun out of anybody in the party. They were laughing, they had smiles, and then the other ones were just church people's like, you know, conversations happening that looked so boring to me. All I wanted to do was sit at that table with the guys that were wearing all black and just hanging out with smiles on their faces and ready to play a show. Yeah, I think that's so key. Like growing up and seeing that ethnic music everywhere at social functions and weddings and dances and banquets and even at the, like the nightclub scene, belly dancing, yeah. all that stuff. It was so pervasive and it, it really had an impact. Sounds like it's the same story with you. It really drove you and inspired you to get involved with this music. Yeah, it was the only thing that resembled that concert I saw when I was a kid. And there was also this Arabic channel called TV Orient that if some people from Detroit are listening to this, they're going to laugh because TV Orient was like our MTV. I mean, they had Majdil Husseini, which was this keyboard master at the time. Hanim Hanna, also the composer and keyboard player, would come up. These guys played with Abdel Wahab and Um Kaltoums and Abdel Halim. So these guys were just like the masters. So they would always have like this like band they would put together and kind of have a little bit of a funk to it too. So it was kind of cool to see as a kid. You're just like, all right, this is the other side of the world because I only had one reference, which was that Evo VHS that I used to watch. So TV Orient had a little something to do with it. There was a band in Detroit that's still rocking till this day called Bell's Band, Majid Keka, who's a Chaldean guy. Yeah, I have some, uh, some of their recordings and stuff. Still killing it right now. And that guy inspired me a lot with his professionalism, you know, and again, they looked like they were always having the best time. I never wanted to be with the people hanging out or running around with the little kids. I would always just tell my parents, I'm going to stand right on the side of the stage. So if you ever need to find me, I'm not going anywhere from this spot. 
Yeah. And what was your gateway from standing at the edge of the bandstand, which a lot of us have done to getting up on stage? So funny. I was working in the jewelry industry, just like every other kid whose parents are jewelry polishers and diamond setters. It's a very familiar story, yeah. Yeah, so one day my friends from Herman's were like, hey, our, one of our workers is Greek. They have a Greek church festival and come hang out with us. And so my friend Rudy at the festival, he's like, hey, there's a Dumbek on stage, bro, go play it. I was like, bro, I can't go take that guy's Dumbek. That's so disrespectful. He's like, just go, I'll, I'll take you on stage. I'm like, no, 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 no. He drags me by the hand and he looked at the guy and they all looked at each other and they just said, all right, they were called the Levendes. Oh, I have their records. Yeah, I, I've listened to all their records. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's some Armenian guys that have played with them too. They're a really good Greek band. Yeah, totally. And yeah, so the the Greek band let me go up on stage. I played some Tsiftateli, and you know that's pretty much all I kind of knew. And then all of a sudden, they I, I'll never forget it. John Pappas, their bazooki player, goes out. Hey, uh, Dan, this one's uh, a nine eight kid. And I had no idea how to play a 9-8 at all. And I was like, oh, okay. And that showed me like, hey, you got some limitations here. You got to go and do some homework. Because, you know, they were doing Calamatiano, which is in 7-8 too. So I got to fix the situation here. And then all of a sudden, Mike Levanos was in the crowd. He, he was getting ready to start a band in Detroit. And he comes up to me after the show. He's like, give me your number, bro. I'd love to have you play percussion with me one day. I'll help you learn some stuff. And little did I know, this guy started calling me. He taught me about Mitropanos. He taught me about Agelopoulos. He taught me Terzis and Caras and all those like really amazing Greek singers. But for me, Mitropanos is my favorite. What actions did you take to kind of get to the point where you started playing professionally? Practicing every single day, not letting a day go by where I just, I didn't do it just to become professionally. I was just addicted. I didn't get into like studying much until a friend of mine took me to a music teacher and he's like, hey, we're going to go meet this guy. He's a music professor who also builds kanuns. His name is Johnny Serwet. And Johnny Serwet has a, a brother named Ramon Serwe, which is from Windsor. He's also a famous violinist. And I went to Johnny Serwe and he was interesting moment. Like when little kids meet a person in their life, they don't know his impact maybe till 20 years later. They'll be like, oh my God, meeting that guy changed everything. And at the moment, I had no idea. So I was, I go up to him. I'm like, yeah, hello, sir. I want to learn how to play Doombek. And he's like, man, don't learn how to play Doombek. You're not going to do anything with it. Let me teach you theory on the keyboard, and that will launch you to much further places than just learning how to play patterns the right way on the drum. It went heavily into theory. And at the time, I was like, why am I learning all this stuff? Key signatures and, you know, how many flats make C minor? How many sharps make this one? And, you know, just like learning key signatures, learning the time signatures, circle of fifths which became later with scars, one of the biggest things that helped me finding notes whenever I was like in trouble, <laughs> you know, with chords. I was like, wait, hold on. If I'm here, if I'm on C, then maybe it's F or something. Or if I'm in play to this D, maybe it's a G. Why don't we jump into there or A and E or whatever the hell. And Danny, you mentioned scars on Broadway. So what brought you from Detroit to LA and what are your thoughts on musically what you've been doing here in Southern California? My very good friend, Levon Sultanian from One Side Zero, his friend called me up one day and he was like, let's go and watch my cousin's band play. And all of a sudden I meet this guy from LA. He's Armenian. He's an awesome guitar player. One Side Zero just got their deal. And I was so inspired. And so constantly kept in touch with those guys. And I moved to Las Vegas. I started from scratch. I left the Greek band. I left the Detroit recording studio I was working in. I just left everything and I was like, I got to get to LA somehow. So fast forward, now I go to Sacramento and One Side Zero's coming to Sacto and they're like, hey, you know, can we stay at your apartment? I'm like, man, are you kidding me? I, I don't have any friends here. Of course you guys could stay here. This is the best thing ever. One Side Zero comes up, we start hanging out. They're like, listen, after the show, we're starting this new band called The Bloom. And our drummer is going to be Roy Mayorga. So if you guys, if you know, if you want a drum tech for us, we could talk to Roy and probably be, you can be the drum tech. And I was like, any day, if Roy approves, I am moving to LA to drum tech for him. I don't even want to get paid. I just want to learn the game. I want to be a part of the professional scene in Los Angeles. And yeah, I just made the move once the bloom started kicking off and I went and started drum teching for Roy. Obviously, we talked and I had met Roy as a fan a few times. 
he remembered me and was like, yeah, that was that kid always talked about drums. Bring him. Let's. I don't know if all of our listeners will know who Roy is. Yeah, Roy Mayorga is, is born in New York, punk rock guy. He was in a band called Nausea, and then he went into a band called Soulfly, Soulfly from Max Cavalera. Yeah. So once Max Cavalera brought him on, he kind of got a little bit more of that worldwide fame because now he's like playing Big Day Out and playing the big festivals. And I saw him once live in Detroit with Static X, and I was like, this guy is playing with his heart and soul. And I started to really follow him. When he left Soulfly, they went right into a bloom. And now Roy plays in Stone Sour with Corey Taylor. Actually, Roy right now is the new drummer taking over for Vinnie Paul and Hell Yeah, because they needed somebody to fill Vinnie's shoes. So now Roy's doing that gig, which is so awesome because Roy would represent Vinnie's, you know, drumming with tons of respect. And now I'm with Roy, my drumming idol. And all of a sudden I'm in L.A. and John Dolmayan is walking into the room at their gigs and now I'm around the system of a down world in L.A. now. And I'm like, holy smokes. For our listeners, John Dolmayan that he's referring to is the drummer of System of a Down. Yeah. Now I'm in system of a down world. And I, and I really like, I obviously love that, you know, being Armenian guys and, you know, knowing that some of them are from Middle Eastern countries too. So it's like, man, if I get to LA, I wish I could meet those guys. Maybe they'll have like a friend who's starting a band. But first I have to get my skills down because, you know, you have like that, like East Coast mentality. And then you move to LA and you hear a real professional musician play. And you're like, oh, man, I am so watered down. Like, I got to really get some flavoring in me. <laughs> so you got to yeah. practice and practice and, and just try to achieve that. And I was hitting the faith no more so hard, practicing drum set all the time. And Doombeck was like completely gone out of my life at that point because I was just in this rock scene, you know. At that time, I met the Visa guys and they were trying to yeah. do something, mixing Middle Eastern with rock and and uh, that's when I started working with Pete. And that was like the first band I joined in LA was, was Visa before I played any Middle Eastern gigs or anything. And then one day, my friends invited me to go to San Francisco to hang out with the System crew because System of a Down had a concert. And at that time, like I had mentioned, you know, John, the drummer of System, would be at like a lot of the shows I was working. And there was a show where the Apex Theory had me do like this Doombag solo in like the middle of one of their shows. I remember John was at that show and it was like, oh, cool, man. The drummer of System of a Down got to watch me play a show. That's incredible because I've been to like all his shows in Detroit. So now fast forward, I go up to San Francisco to see System play with Mars Volta. And I'm just hanging out with Sako and the drum tech and, you know, the, the guys and the crew and stuff. And John walks up to me and he's like, yo, tonight you're going to come play that little Tumbek solo thing on stage with us. And I'm like, all right, dude, <laughs> you know what, man? This is not funny, you know? <laughs> this, don't f*** with me like that. That's not funny. Metallica's in the crowd. They're hanging out with them. I remember Kurt Hammett was there and Lars were side stage. And I was like, all right, man, like this is for real happening. John goes to the security guards. He's like, this guy's going to come up, do this jam with us that we're doing during war. It's on YouTube. You could check it out. You put my name and their name in. Uh, thanks for to Simon for videotaping it because if he didn't, I would have never had any. Everyone in the world would for sure think I'm full of crap because no one. You're talking about si Simon Majerian. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. Simon, who has designed all of our Toxim labels. He was the only guy with a digital camera, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> we all had flip phones. I mean, I didn't know that. That's there's some there's some LA lore right there. Yeah, and uh, it's weird. I remember right before the security guards coming to take me to the back of the stage to go through the back and go go to the riser. I wasn't nervous at all. It was the weirdest thing ever. This calm hit me that like everything that you've done is leading up to this moment because you used to go to bed dreaming about playing with System of a Down and rock bands in LA and you're about to perform in front of them. And Metallica, Lars Ulrich is right there to the left hanging out with Kurt Hammett. I'm like, this is crazy, but you know, you have to take a deep breath and know that I'm not going to get psyched out by this. I'm not, I didn't even know what we were doing. Imagine that. And if you know John Lomayan, you'll know. He won't tell you, oh, what we're going to do here is for four bars do this and eight bars do that. He's just like, you'll figure it out. I was like, what are you talking about, bro? Tell me what it is. <laughs> and he's like, don't worry. John Theodore has been doing it with me every night and it's going to be fine. You'll, you'll, you'll do it tonight. 
So I just jump up there and I just start following his lead. And now I'm in just like cruise control mode. And it's like, you know, one of those things that happens, like if you're meant for it, you're going to do it. If you're not meant for it, that moment, you may fall flat on your face. And But there was no way I was going to let that bother me, the, the pressure of this moment. No one in the band knew I was doing it, though. So now the show's oh, over. sprung it on all of them. <laughs> Show, show's over. I'm like on this like crazy, like I cannot believe what just happened. And all of a sudden, one of the assistants, Hamps, walks up to me. He's like, hey, man, they're fighting in the dressing room, bro, because like the band's mad. Why do I John let this guy who's this amateur come play on stage with them? <laughs> and I was like, what? I don't want them to fight. Like, I don't, there wasn't a fight. They were just arguing. And then somebody tells me, Lars walks in the dressing room. He's like, yo, guys, that, that jam you guys did in the middle was so cool. And they were like, wait, it was? <laughs> I'm Little like, perspective. I can't believe I'm hearing this from from the guys. This is like everything that happened that day was will be with me forever. Lars saying that it was like, oh, it wasn't so bad. Okay, so it wasn't bad. <laughs> their concern was like this guy came and butchered something, you know. But you know, on a huge stage, you can't really hear what everyone's doing unless it's in your monitors and the, so. After that moment, I was like, all right, cool. I made it in life. That was the moment. I could go get a job and I'm done. That was it. I did it, you know? <laughs> that was it. And then it's the pinnacle of live performance in rock. And then the next day I go to Sacramento. I used to live there. And so now all my friends from Sacramento come out to the show and I run up to John again. I go, yo, can we do that today? Because <laughs> now I actually know what we're doing. And he's like, come on up. I went up again. And then the night after in Fresno, I went up again with him. I was like, can we do it again, bro? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> and eventually he said no, because the next night was in Vegas. And I asked that night after Fresno, I got the ride on the bus with the crew. And now That's I'm on awesome. the bus, bro. I went from like Detroit, like <laughs> buying their albums, Pledge of Allegiance tour. Now I'm in the bus with the crew drinking beers. And I played like, I'm not just tagging along. I actually played and I'm like, all right, they cleaned the junk bunk for me. I was like, oh my God, man, <laughs> this, is, this is it. Junk bunk is the best. Game, junk bunk for everybody is the place where you put all like the luggage and all the bags <laughs> you accumulate. Nobody ever sleeps oh, there. man, that's the touring life right there. Yeah, bro. So then Darren asks like, yo, bring that guy backstage. Like, cause I would play with them, but I would never go hang with them. It was like play. And then like my after show pass time would like expire and I'd be back by the semi trucks. So imagine I'm on, I go from being on stage for like a good five minutes or three minutes, whatever it was. <laughs> and then it's like, all right, you got to go that way because you don't have the right pass and you don't have this. And, Cause I really wasn't invited. It was just John being a bro. And, and then Darren's like, yo, go get that guy. They're looking for me. Where are you? I'm like, I'm by the semi trucks behind the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm not allowed to be anywhere anymore. The show's over. And they come and get me. I meet the band. I obviously say my thank yous. I take a couple pictures with them. And a few months later, Sako, the drum tech, hits me up. He's like, I got to talk to you. Uh, Darren was asking about what your plans are. He's starting a new band after Ozfest. It's called Scars on Broadway. If you want to be in it, it was just like, wow, okay. And so I meet with Darren, you know, long story short, to talk about it. And he's like, yo, man, I got to just finish OzFest with the band and then we're going to start Scars. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, man. You need any help on that tour, by the way? And he's like, actually, I do. I, mean, I need somebody to, you know, be, do a little PA work for me and also do the pedals on stage. You know, so you got to learn our whole set. I was like, guess what? I already know your whole set. So... <laughs> So yeah, man, I went on tour with them and did Ozfest, and now every day I like I go to the second stage and I'm watching Ozzy Osbourne and I'm just like full on in music school. I never was like I'm gonna come to this thing and party. I was just taking it as like now I want to see how the real pro production gets down. That was yeah. the goal. Always the goal is always to just figure out what is the top level professionalism. Where is it happening? I want to learn from that. I want to learn who are the best guys. And the guy that really, really was the most amazing person on that tour that became my good friend was Mike Borden from Faith No More. 
space no more, yeah. And I like got to spill my guts to him and tell him what I'm doing here. And he just like, it was like the best guy ever. It was like an uncle who was so proud of you every day. After that tour, we kicked off Scars on Broadway with Darren, where I played keyboards and some percussion parts on the- Yeah, you were, yeah I was going to say, you're so versatile. Like you weren't just doing percussion with that group. You were playing keys. Rhythm yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. What happened was now we get into Scars on Broadway pre-production rehearsals and I bring like all my percussion stuff. I'm like, all right, I'm about to go play percussion, man. It's going to be awesome. And I bring everything I own and I'm sitting around all my stuff. Like, you know, like in, when you watch Modern Drummer Magazine articles, you see like the percussionist with all of the stuff around him. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, uh how do you play percussion to these heavy rock songs? I'm like, I don't hear any percussion here. This is like very rock and roll. Like, I don't know what to do here. And I'm like, yo, uh, Darren, uh, what, are, what, are, what, are, what are the parts here? How do you, exp-? he's like, oh, actually I got a couple keyboard leads for this part. See, on the OzFest, I took a little keyboard with me because I like to play keyboards. I wasn't like a pro, but because of the theory I learned, this all goes back to Johnny Sedwat. The theory that Johnny Serwa taught me, I never lost that. I was always working on my maqam training and learning bayati and ras. At the time, siga was a little foreign to me. It was a little weird to be on the root note of quarter tone and all that stuff. So I was playing just the basics, nahawan and stuff. And so I have a PSR 62 Yamaha. It's an ultimate classic keyboard that plays quarter tones. Like, yeah, it's, it's like a little, little keyboard. The top basic keyboard in the world that plays quarter tones. So I brought that on the tour and he realized, okay, this guy isn't like a keyboard master, but he gets the gist of it. And in rock music, not everybody needs to be John Lord, especially when you're playing pop-based music. It's a lot of word structures and just really laying down foundations and but you got to obviously still know what you're doing and how to accompany with your left hand so darren was like hey there's some keyboard parts to these songs it would really help if you were able to play them and so he suggested to me you should take some lessons on piano it won't hurt you man it's then not saying he was always so nice about it he was like i'm not trying to say like you're not good but just get there you know it'll help you get there and i was like all right so i researched one of the best teachers in LA, Howard Richman, and he kind of put me through some stuff. We would go through like little sections of like Chopin. We would go through little sections of Franz Liszt. Well, he wouldn't take me through the whole Polonaise. Yeah, like a little taste of it. Yeah, because he knew, like he was doing things where he was getting actors ready for roles and he was getting people in these moments where he can get you to know how to play the instrument and navigate. And we revisited the circle of fifths and he taught me how to harmonize things. He actually took me more into like diminished, augmented, how to play, like how to complement with, you know, adding that seven chord there and adding, you know, sharp five and just understanding chord structure and chord accompaniment. And what am I doing here? And I started to build a independence with playing rhythm on my left hand and playing the leads on my right in order to really complement the job for Darren's songs because there was moments where I would have to play organ rhythm on my left and then play the lead all on another keyboard. So I was like, all right, we're going to do the the yes setup and just go like full on like L-shaped four keyboards, two on front of me, two to the left, and we're just going to go, you know, full on. So it was just like, again, obsession, ultimate devotion, no parties, no late night anything's just pure practice every day when everyone was out calling me to go to the rainbow drinking at the roxy i was at home practicing keyboards getting ready for scars on broadways recording uh, whatever they whatever he needed me to do darren i was getting ready to do that i didn't want to have any limitations and i had a lot of time to prep too yeah he would be like here's the song and we're going to record it in a few months so just get it down man you know what's interesting you have a fluency with the, like the middle eastern modal music Makam, like you, you referenced it in what you were explaining, and then you were playing rock music. You know, I mean, for some of our listeners, you're, you're just throwing out names that most people, in terms of who are listening to this, might not know. But these are titans of rock, progressive rock, pop. Like these are some huge names from like the last 40, 50 years. So it's interesting for us at Toxium to hear from someone who's done so much in both worlds. It's kind of what falls into your lap. So you just take it and, and you go with it. And, you, you know, and obviously it all fit naturally. And it's funny because to segue into another thing that entered my life at that moment was when I was on tour with System during that OzFest, I bought an album at Virgin Records that was uh, 
called The Arabian Flute. And I started listening to this album. Every day when I woke up, I would listen to this album. And it was like a very therapeutic, very ambient album. It would wake me up every day and it would get me ready. And I would just like be listening to this. And I was like, wait, I don't just like this. I want to learn how to create the sound this guy's making with this flute. So I called Jivan Gasparian Jr., obviously. And I was like, do you, do you know anyone who plays the Ney in LA? And he was like, yeah, there's this Persian guy that plays with my grandfather. Call him up. He'll get you a Ney. So then I get back from Ozfest. He had got me a Persian ney, which is played completely different than a conventional Eastern nays that we play like in, you know, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, stuff like that. You know, so then I'm on this search. And so I just kept searching and finding ney players in LA. So now I'm like learning keyboards and playing it with scars now, but also the ney has just begun to take shape in my life in 2006 and enter my life and not ever want to leave as hard and as tough as the Ney is and as complicated of an instrument to find a one that plays in relatively proper tone and pitch. It became like a big journey of mine. When I say ultimate devotion, to do a few different instruments and devote your time to them is like, it takes so much energy. Yeah. And I can say working with you performing out here in LA, we've done gigs together. Yeah. You've played percussion. Mm -hmm. And then with Visa, you mentioned we had you come in and you played some beautiful nay. Thank you. Work on one of our recent records, playing so many instruments well, you know, it's you tip your cap kind of thing. Thanks, bro. I mean, that, that, that all kind of came from, it's funny. Look how, look how everything is so interconnected. I remember when my parents were getting a divorce and the Gladiator movie came out, when I heard Jivan Gasparian Sr. play on that soundtrack, he played the way I felt because of what was happening in the family. I was like, if I can be LA's go-to nay player for film compositions, that would be something really, really cool. And by 2014, I had gotten myself to a level with the help of Dr. Ali Jihad Rasi from UCLA. He's my primary nay mentor, took me under his wing and helped me so much. And I got to score a film with Klaus Badelt and Mark Yagir, which is called The Queen of the Desert, starring Nicole Kitman and Damian Day-Lewis and James Franco. You'll be able to like hear a lot of my Ney playing in that movie, which was a dream come true. Speaking of Ney, you've recently put out a music video that features some of your Ney and percussion and all your, your versatile skills. We'd love for you to share some info about that for our listeners. Yeah, that's an uh, original piece of music that I worked on uh, in my house this last winter. I have a few more coming out now that I've put that out. It's getting me in the mode of like exposing a lot more of my personal inner works as being a sideman and a companyist. I guess it, you build a little bit of a courage to start showing people what's inside your heart and the melodies that you have inside your soul and the stuff that it's personal to you. The mission behind that is I'd love to have some of my original work be put in films. I want to score a film. With my song Seaside Sultress, I mean, my instrumental, it's just me exposing like a catalog that I'll be releasing for very ambient tracks with the Ney, with some of my percussion work. I had my very good friend, amazing composer and producer, Demetrius Mann, and he helped me produce it. I brought him my Logic files. The song was all structured out. He came and was like, all right, that kick drum sound can be fattened up. This keyboard sound, I have a better one for it. We'll stick this arpeggio bass in instead of your bass sound. And, you know, he helped me really fatten it up. And then me and a buddy of mine, Yoni, went and worked with my friend Alia. And we made a music video. Yeah, it's just something that's personal I like to share with the world. And I'm, I'm really happy the way it came out. And, and you know, sometimes you write something and you wish you would have changed that part or this. I don't feel like that about this one. Yeah, it sounded great. I remember when you were sharing it with us a few days ago. It sounds great. The, the music video looks great. Very well done. So much, man. Thank you. I, we, yeah, we did a, like a lot of edits. I think this is good for people that are listening, that are working on something. I don't think you should just go with like your first draft if you're not sure with it. You got to like sometimes like work on something. Let it settle in for a minute, you know, watch it back. I found like tons of mistakes in the first draft, the second draft. And every time I would just like chip away and chip away. And then I was like, all right, I think we got it yeah, now. Congrats. Thank you guys. 
So Danny, so where can people follow you online if they want to hear your music or learn more about you? I have an Instagram page and my Facebook page also is Danny Shamoons. Uh, I have a band that I put together with me uh, as like the nay soloist called the Global Trance Ensemble. So you can also check out that uh, Instagram site, which has our latest concert that we did for CSUN Northridge. Really excited about what's to come. Constantly making music and going to be putting out a lot more of these instrumental pieces as I finish. Yeah, them. we can't wait to hear what you have in store. And and it's it's great having you on. You're you're an interesting, unique guest. Oh, thank you. Uh, to so hear from you. Funny. It's cool to share all of these stories and all this background with everyone. Thank so you. Thanks. I mean, it's really my honor. I hope it helps inspire some people to know that just do whatever you love to do and, and everything else, it'll figure itself out if you truly have the right intention behind it. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. This was this was amazing. The stories are gold, like going from like the Lavendes, and I remember getting that CD. Right? <laughs> You're just like now. When, when we were kids, we grew up listening to that stuff. Yeah, because there's Ara Tupuzian. God, if you know him, Ara Tupuzian used to record. Look, the studio I worked at when I was in Detroit from 18 to 20 before I moved out, I called Chris Sefkalis from the Levendes and was like, you guys just recorded your album with this engineer called Scott, right? I hear everybody saying great things about him. Can you get me a job at his studio? And he's like, I don't know, bro. You know, the guy, he doesn't have like, he's not going to hire you. He's not. I go, just, I just want to look inside and smell the freaking control room, please. <laughs> And then they introduced me to him. I went to him. He was like, I don't really have a job here for you. But I was like, all right, I'll clean the bathrooms for free. You know, I'm not joking. Like, not even, no joke, cliche. I was like, I'll clean the bathrooms for free and I'll make the coffee and I'll get you guys lunch. I just want to learn what happens in a music studio. And then I ended up doing sessions, you know, he, he took me from like pushing just the play button on the tape machine. We used to use tape at that time, as some listeners will be like, what is a tape machine? <laughs> and it's all because of the Levendes, man. That's crazy. And, and then the nay, all the stuff Johnny Sedwath taught me when I was freaking 16 years old, when I was old enough to drive, all of that was just in some memory bank somewhere stored in the back of my mind. And I was like, oh, when he told me about going from, for instance, like Rust and going into Hijaz here. Oh, and then going in from, you know, Siga to, to Hijaz there, Rahat al-Arwah, these combinations of maqams and Suznak and, you know, learning all these like different. Suznak's one of my favorites. Suznak is awesome. You know, learning how to play Saba. And, and I was just like, oh man, my dream was to play Saba on the Ney and how it feels. And then I get the Ney and I realize you can't even make a sound out of it until like years later, you're able to actually start playing it. But man, we stuck together. I never got angry at it. I never got frustrated. I just knew that every time I break down a barrier, I'm going to get closer to playing that sound that I've wanted to achieve. And if you hear on my track, Seaside Sultris, that sound with the double, we call it midwiz, which is like that double reed sound in the thicker <laughs> register. That was my dream to make that sound on it. So I'm so happy I get to share it with everybody, whoever hears it. Because I was listening through and it was just really well done. I mean, a lot of the articulations, all the stuff you're doing, I'm sure that's extremely difficult to do. It takes years to get your mouth to allow yourself to yeah, play. It's the next thing. level embouchure on that thing. To play because with, yeah, with your embouchure and then allowing your tongue to do those like arpeggio things. It's not natural. Like your throat and back of your tongue have nothing to do with that. That You're just not developed that way. But it's one of those things. If you can hear it in your head, you can play it. But if you can't hear it, you may not be able to use the muscles correct in your body. But So with that transfer between the mind, the heart, the soul, and then it just starts to happen through the instrument, it's magical. And Antranik, I mean, you playing another instrument that comes from fresh water any of our wooden instruments that are reed instruments they come from fresh water it's one of the most spiritual amazing process in the world it is so magical when you connect the two and the flute doesn't start playing until you warm it up with your breath that's why i love the nay it's, it's pretty much my favorite wind instrument because to me it's like your breath your soul it's alive man it's just like come your spirit coming through the instrument it has such a haunting sound and I'll tell you what, you could play a guitar lick and be like, all right, this sounds okay, like the one that I want to learn. But the nay, if you really aren't full 100% 
everything in your body moving with it. It just won't even make a sound. Yeah, that's, that's so fragile. That, I, I don't want to disrespect guitar. I'm just saying you could pick it yeah, up yeah. and hit a note. It'll still make the note. Even if you hate it, you'll still make a note. But the nay, it's not going to give you any response unless you truly, it's kind of like a girl, you know, you got to really show her love or else she'll be like, nope, you're not getting me. <laughs> yeah, well said. Thank you for your time, Danny. And thank you again for listening to the podcast. Please leave us a five-star written review on iTunes if you can. It really helps get the word out. You can check us out online at takeus.im or search for us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Now, without further ado, here's Seaside Sultrist by Danny Shimon.